Glad you could join me again today. I mentioned uh, J.R. Vassar's book, Glory Hunger, last week, and today I want to invite you to join me to just look at an abbreviated version of a few things that he wrote that really spoke to my heart and I hope will be an encouragement to you today. As I began reading the book, probably the most um, interesting and astute illustration he made is right in the first few pages. He speaks about a trip he took to the Far East and when he came across some people that were worshiping a Buddha. Well, that isn't strange in the Far East, but what was happening behind the Buddha is what caught his attention. While the people in the front were bowing and, and praying and burning incense be, behind the big uh, statue, there had been erected scaffolding and workers were doing repairs. And so here's what he writes. The broken people were bowing down to a broken Buddha, asking the broken Buddha to fix their broken lives while someone else fixed the broken Buddha. It's a very sad picture, a picture missionaries see all the time. But you know what? We needn't get smug in our Christianity. While we might not bow down to a man-made idol, we too can be guilty of looking to the wrong things to try to fix things that are wrong in our lives. We get preoccupied with acceptance or recognition and we tend to bow down to whatever uh, it costs to succeed. We want our peers to recognize us and to appreciate us and so we put on a big facade and we believe that their praise will bring us the joy and the satisfaction that we're looking for but while we're longing for justification from man, we're missing the ultimate justification. Many times we might strive to carve out a, a space in our life by our, by our own sweat, blood, sweat, and tears. We want to be a self-made person. We want self-sufficiency and independence and control, and we think that that will make us happy. But one phone call, one car crash, one economic tumble, and our whole world is broken. We look at relationships thinking, well, if I could get them to love me more, then I'd be happy. But the more we grasp, the, the more we lose our grip. And the more we try to win and please, the more distance it seems to build. That's because we're worshiping a broken Buddha that will leave us broken as well. A world, Vassar writes, with everything orbiting around us will crumble because it is not real. We're guilty of worshiping a broken Buddha of our own making. So how can we judge ourselves? How can we remove or recognize these broken things in our lives and avoid falling into those traps? Well, St. Augustine wrote years ago a key that many of us forget. We know it in principle, but we forget how important it is. He says, there is a scale of value stretching from earthly to heavenly realities, from the visible to the invisible, and the inequality between these goods makes possible the existence of them all. For example, God is one thing, angels are another, as are peoples, or terriers, red oaks, vegetables, rocks, and dirt. Each fits into God's overall scheme of creation. And even though each thing God made is good and delightful, legitimate and a source of satisfaction and has a purpose as an object of our love or appreciation, we must not expect more from it than its unique nature can provide. We must give love and praise to these things apportioned to their worth. For example, you wouldn't love a rock as much as you might love your pet. And hopefully, you wouldn't love your pet more than you would love your child or your spouse. Wouldn't you agree? You know, I thought of the little example of like a child who chooses a nickel over a dime because he thinks it's larger, so it's worth more because he doesn't understand monetary value. And you know, we can do similar things when we look to broken things to fix our broken lives. So that brings us back to consider what we really value. So ask yourself, what value do you put on the things in your life? I'm going to just read off a little list of a few things I thought of, and I want you to kind of put them into one to ten, one being the most important thing. So where would you place your children, your job, your spouse, your health, your friendships? Where does God fit into this situation? 
what people think about you. How important is that? Your success. Maybe what kind of car you drive or your own personal happiness. And you might even, even think of some other things that are of more value or more important in your top 10. But here's what happens though. We'll mark on that little piece of paper or in our mind right now that, oh yes, God or our spouse or our children, they're, they're at the very top of our list. But then we fail to make them a priority in our daily decisions. We don't pray. We don't read our Bibles. We aren't even attending church, many of us. And yet we'll say that God is very important. We'll keep long hours at work or be grumpy around the house or distant with our love. And yet we'll claim to be a loving father or a loving mother. You know, something's wrong there. Vassar points out that we give attention to less worthy things when we should be focusing on worthy objects. That's because our value system is broken. And he moves on from there to help us understand the worthiest object, which is God himself. He writes, the invitation of this great and gracious king is what we would die, is that we would die to ourselves, unself our lives, and center on him so that we might really live. I love that little phrase, unself our lives. And this is the issue, really. This is the issue of his whole book, that we are so hung up and infatuated with ourselves that we can barely find time to give God a moment's praise. We're so busy trying to advance our lives that we forget that God is the one that gives the increase. We get so self-focused, so short-sighted and busy worshiping our broken Buddha that we're missing out on the love of a lifetime. And as we lavishly expend energy seeking our own glory, we're missing out on the glory of God. Referring to Isaiah 6, Vassar writes, In the light of God's glory, he, speaking of Isaiah, was stripped of his own. Listen to this little portion in Isaiah if you don't know it. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And then said I, Isaiah says, Woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This was Isaiah's response when he put God into his rightful place. And Vassar says, when the smoke clears and the dust all settles, only one person in the cosmos is left standing, and everyone else is kneeling. And you know who that one that's standing is? It is the King of glory. It is Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who is not broken. He doesn't need scaffolding. He deserves our highest praise, and he is the only one who is able to fix our broken lives. So let me challenge you this week to examine your value system. Are you chasing broken things, trying to fix your broken life? Are you finding emptiness and disappointment at every turn? Do you need to unself? your life and get your focus back on God? As the songwriter wrote, only Jesus can satisfy your soul, for only he can cleanse your heart and make you whole. I pray today that you would bow your heart to this King of glory and let him do the repairs. He made you, he can fix you. I'll see you next week.